Welcome to Writers on Writing. I'm your host, Dr. Brenda Green, and we're coming to you from the studio of Megar Evers College over the airways of WNYE 91.5 FM. Writers on Writing comes to you every Sunday and gives you, our listening audience, an opportunity to hear writers from the African diaspora talk about their work, their craft, and their lives. I host the Writers on Writers program, and I'm also executive director of the Center for Black Literature and director of the National Black Writers Conference, as well as chair of the English department. I'm very, very pleased to have with me on the telephone this evening a guest who you've heard many years ago, Professor M.K. Asante. Welcome, Professor Asante. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Green. It's an honor. Oh, it's, it's well... You are very welcome, and it's very, very exciting to have you talking about your latest work, Buck, which, in the words of, I'm going to share with the audience, Ta Nahisi Coates, who's author of The Beautiful Struggle, I liked what he wrote about it. He said, M.K. Asante's Buck takes the daily, daily words of the American streets and forges something low and lovely, angry profane and beautiful. It honors the best of hip hop's literary canon by producing a work worthy of inclusion. Here is crack era Philadelphia flipped into a phrase which we've so long needed, but so rarely heard. And when I read that, I said that captures, I think, um, what you've done in this very riveting memoir, one that I found hard to put down, but it was um, a very compelling book. Thank you. You're welcome. So before we go on, before we get into our discussion, I just want to share with the audience some um, background about who you are. Um, M.K. Asante is an award-winning writer, filmmaker, professor, and hip-hop artist, a recipient of award, of awards from the Academy of American Poets and the Lanston Hughes Society, he is the author of the seminal hip-hop text, It's Bigger Than Hip-Hop, and the poetry collections, Beautiful and Ugly Too, and Like Water Running Off My Back. He directed The Black Candle, a star movie, which he co-wrote with Maya Angelou, and who also narrated the prize-winning winning film. He wrote and produced the film 500 Years Later, a winner of five International Film Festival Awards, as well as UNESCO's Breaking the Chains Awards. So you have done a lot in your, your um, I'm going to say short life, but in your young life. I'm saying young life. I can say that, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. Definitely, yep. Yeah. And I'm uh, also, you know, really happy to be, you know, um, a tenure professor at, at Morgan State University, um, you know, and I've, I've been there for about nine years. So, um, yeah, I like to stay busy. <laughs> okay, tenure professor, and what do you teach? I'm in the Department of English and Language Arts. I teach creative writing, screenwriting. I teach a class called It's Bigger Than Hip Hop 2. That's actually based on that book that I wrote. Um, and, you know, so mainly classes dealing with film and literature. Okay, and you have come a long way. So that book, I mean, I, I really loved It's Bigger Than Hip Hop. You you raised some really important questions for what's happening in hip hop in this century. But this book is the memoir. Um, I, I Let me ask you, what motivated you to write this story? Because, you know, I, I said uh, young, young, relatively young professor, but you decided to write a memoir at this time in your life. Why did you want to write this now? There's so many different reasons, um, you know, that I can think of. I'll give you a few that really come to mind that are really strong for me. First of all, you know, um, we talked about hip-hop earlier, and we talked about even just in the introduction about hip-hop's influence. One of the things that uh, hip-hop has, has done in terms of influencing me is it's, um, you know, really put a lot of emphasis on the personal narrative, you know, um, telling your story. And so as a writer, when I think about some of, you know, just the most profound and interesting stuff that I have to, to draw from, a lot of it is from my own life. So that's one, one kind of antidote. Uh, another real deep reason for me, though, uh, to write Buck was, you know, I felt like 
there were a lot of people who didn't understand. I felt like I was doing a disservice to young people by not writing Buck. And what I mean by that is I felt like young people would see me. I was a, I was a tenured professor at 26 years old. I was traveling the world. I was writing. I was doing what I loved. And young people would see me, and they wouldn't see the struggle. They didn't know that there was a struggle. They only knew. They only saw the victory. And what I mean by disservice is when you only see somebody's victories, when you think that, okay, this guy must have had it figured out since he was 13 years old or 14 years old. He must have always known that he wanted to do this, and he must have gotten straight A's and, and graduated with honors and da-da-da-da-da. But the reality is my life was so different than that. And I, I felt like by, by not portraying that, by not being open about that, it's really kind of like doing a disservice to people because they don't really realize that without that struggle is the victory. You know what I mean? So I start to feel very empowered to tell some of the things that I was ashamed of before, some of the things that I didn't really want to talk about before when I was younger, I felt like it would be important for young people to understand that no matter what they're going through, no matter what how dark it is right now, that there is this light, that there is this path, that there is this, this glory in finding your purpose and becoming who you are. And I wanted to share the most difficult part of my life. So the, the the third reason I would say is as a writer, we look for challenges. We all have the things in our head, the ideas in our head, the stories in our head that we don't want to do. And we don't want to do them because we're scared of them, right? Everyone has a project that they're scared to do. They're scared because they don't know how this person is going to react. Or they're scared because they don't know how what it's going to do to them or how it's going to transform them. They're scared because they haven't thought about this thing in years or they're scared of this thing or whatever it is that's, that's holding us hostage. And so for me, Buck was the thing that I was scared to write in a way. And for me as a writer, the, the, the whole idea is to run towards that fear and to embrace the things that we're scared to do because a lot of times that's where the real juice is. And so those are some of the reasons, you know, that influenced me. Right. And, and you, you're so right. It takes so much courage to write a memoir. Most people are afraid to share those most intimate parts of their life. It takes courage because that's not only forcing you to confront your fears and your anxieties and your guilt or whatever and your hopes and your desires, but it also would have an impact on your family and on others who are close to you. Because you also, in telling your story, you're telling their story too. So what has been the reaction of, of your family and, and close friends to this? Because one of the things that also struck me is your story, as you said, is not one that people would think you had. Because it, it really clearly illustrates how the struggle that young black men go through cuts across class. It is not just restricted to class. It, it doesn't matter who your parents are. It's a struggle that so many have to go through. So what has been the reaction of your family and close friends, those whose stories you had to end up also sharing? Yeah, um, well, you know, that's a great question. I come from a family of, you know, artists and writers and thinkers. And when I, was, when I first set out to write the book, um, Everybody was really supportive of me in terms of just telling me, like, you know, tell your story, write your, write your story. Um, and people were really supportive. And so that was good. You know, um, I worked closely. My mom is, is one of, she's probably one of my closest, I mean, she is my closest friend, you know. And um, so, you know, I would talk to my mom a lot about the story. Um, I, you know, I remember when I came up with the title, I called my mom <laughs> and uh, without even saying anything else, because so, she knew I was working on a, a memoir and I wanted to tell my story and tell it rawly. But um, I called her one day and I just said, I said, Mom. And she said, what? And I said, Buck. <laughs> <laughs> and she just said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. She knew exactly what I was talking about and she knew that it, it was significant to who I am, that just that word and that, that meaning. Um, so everybody, everybody was really supportive. And then I think for me, the hardest part to write, to write the memoir, the hardest part for me was to get over. It was psychological. It was mental. It was getting over caring what anybody thought. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we care about what people think, especially the people who are close to us, people, you know, we, we want them to think good of us. We want them to like what we're doing and all these things. But for me, in order to really write this book the way I needed to tell the story, the way I needed to tap in 
into that energy um, the way I needed to tap into that realness. I had to get to a point where I, I didn't, it's, and it's not, I'm not saying this to be harsh or cruel or sound cold, but I couldn't care what people thought. You know what I mean? If I care what people thought, then I would be not writing a, a memoir, you know? Right. Um, I would not be writing something that's true to myself. So I had to, like, get rid of that, you know, in order to actually write. And then that's what allowed me to actually write the memoirs, to not care about it. So by the time I was finished, the memoir, even though, you know, sure, we want people to, to like it and we want our close family members and friends to say, yeah, this is great, um, I really didn't care. <laughs> okay. And I, like I said, I know that by sounds cold, but that's what you, to me, that's what you have to do to get to that level. And um, and my family was receptive of it. You know, I learned that, you know, um, one of the lessons that I learned um, is that you can be in the same house with someone, um, same room with someone, and have a different perspective. You know, and, and it's interesting when you think about that metaphor perspective, right? Me, me and you, Dr. Green, we can be in the same room, right? We could be witnessing the same event occur, right? But depending on where I'm sitting and depending on where you're sitting, Right. Depending on your view and depending on my view, depending on, you know, what you can see and what I can see and where you are in you know, relationship to the room and where I am in relationship to the room, we may very well see different things. We may notice different things. So one thing I noticed when when I wrote the book is just that there are people who are close to me um, who have a different account. They saw something different during that during that moment or in that room, you know. And so I respect that. And I, I learned about perspective, that it's not. It's not that I'm not, you know, it's not that when someone has a different perspective or sees someone else or sees something else, it doesn't mean that there, it's not, it's, that there's a different truth. It, it just means that, you know, the truth is something that is really, it depends on your perspective and where you are. And so that's one of the things, one of the lessons that I learned um, with Buck is that there are people who are close to me that just had a different perspective on, on something because of where they're standing I, or where I they're understand. sitting or what they saw, what they didn't see. And, um, and so it was, it was instructive in that way. Um, but like I said, for me, in order to, to do justice to the story, um, I had to remove myself um, from really worrying about what other people thought of me. And it's not just in, in, liter in literature. It's also in academia. It's also through in, of in course. my life. Of course. When you look at the language, so you, you write, you've written in different genres. You write essays. You do poetry. This is prose and memoir. This is really, you're using the narrative voice um, to tell this story. How did you... Um, how did you? What was your process for writing this? And you really capture, as as um, Tayanisi was saying, the the language you capture, the hip hop language, and that was that was the part that for me that's a little bit hard for me to read, but I'll, of course is very real and very authentic. And I think that's what makes this such a, a strong book. What was your process, your writing process, for capturing the language and the and the um, the setting and the themes in the way that you did? Well, you know, I wrote the book in the first person present tense. And um, I did that because there's a sense of immediacy and urgency when you write in the first person present tense. You right. know, present tense is really important to me. I come from a screenwriting background as well, where we write present tense a lot. And like I said, it just it brings you in and makes you feel the sense of urgency that the characters feel. I didn't want you to, I didn't want to write this as a, you know, 30-year-old college professor looking back at the things that I did as a teenager and saying, oh, you know, back in the day, you did this. Right. I wanted to actually be in it and, and pull you into it and show you what I saw when I was seeing it, give you the epiphanies as I got the epiphanies, give you the realizations as they came to me, show you the things that were influencing my decisions. You know, I wanted to bring you in that world. And so I felt like that was the best way to do it. And really the process for me, the first thing, like I said, was getting to a place where I didn't care what other people thought of me. And and that wasn't just as a writer. This wasn't just as a story. It was as a as a person, really getting so in tune with myself that nothing really mattered in terms of what other people thought. That was an important step for me in order to be able to write something like like that. Um, the second step for me was, you know, it, this, this was less about memory and more about time travel. So it wasn't, you know, when, I, when we talk about memory, memory is one thing, 
But for me, writing this memoir, I had to go back in time and relive. So it's not about remembering, it's about reliving. And then from that reliving, recounting and writing from that experience. And so what I had to do, and I know it sounds kind of (laughs) far out, (laughs) but what I had to do was go back to 1996 and relive those moments. And that's why, I mean, people say, everyone I talk to, you know, they say they read the book in a day. They read the book in two days. They read the book in three days. They couldn't put the book down. They were on the train. You know, everyone has a sense of like, man, this book basically held me hostage. And part of what I attribute that to is, like I said, really writing from that real live experience. Like, this isn't me reflecting sitting back, reflecting, this is me reliving, and you feel that sense of urgency. You know that this is real. You know that this is, you know, um, authentic. And so that that's part of what I had to do is, like, relive. How long did it take you to write the book? Well, technically, I guess a year. Um, but obviously, you know, things were brewing in my head, and, you know, so much kind of happens before a year. So it really... I probably took a couple years, really, but in terms of, you know, from when I got the contract to when I finished it, it was, I think, about a year. Okay. So your writing process, do you sit down and write every day? Uh, most days, yes, even if it's only a few words. You know, I'm a wordsmith, and I'm a words guy, and so, like, if you look at Buck, you know, one of the things, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne once said that, uh, uh, you know, um, Easy reading is damn hard writing. (laughs) Yes, yes. And I always love that quote because it's true. You know, when people say things like, oh, yeah, I read your book in a day, to me, that's the sign of good writing because, you know, I think the the goal of the writer in so many ways, even though we want to be layered and we want to be complex and we want to take the reader past where they were to a place that they had not yet considered, even though we do all those things, the goal is communication. The goal is conveying the narrative. The goal is storytelling. And so when you have writing that's very clear and lucid, I feel like it's really a reflection of clear and lucid thoughts and, and planning and preparation and outlines and people who put a lot of effort into making sure that you can follow the story. So for me, that was really important. Like, And so some days I will spend, you know, um, And I'm a minimalist. I like to find, and that's where hip-hop comes in as well, right? You have 16 bars to say so much, right? You you know, you're speaking about the the profundity of the world or whatever you're speaking about, but you have 16 bars. You know, we live in a generation now, we have 140 characters, right, on Twitter to say something interesting, to, to make, to provoke thought. And so we come from this generation and this era where we really have to find you know, short language to, to, to talk about long experiences. So sometimes I'll spend a lot of time on a sentence or a paragraph or whatever. So I'll be writing, you know, I'll be working all day, but it was, it's not like I have 20 pages at the end of the day. I understand. A, yes. A, that's... a really tight two sentences. <laughs> okay. All right. and, and to me, that really tight two sentences can, can, can push me to wake up the next morning really early and keep going. You know, that, that that that's all I need sometimes. And then some days you have the days where you bang out 10 or 15 pages or whatever. But for me, it's really more about, like, taking my time and saying exactly, using pre- the precise language that I want to use and evoking the precise emotion that I want to evoke, you know? I see. And um, just continuing with that, this book is also about writing your way into literacy. And I, I was really, um, really, really found very motivating when you talked about beginning that alternative school and sitting and writing for hours. Can you talk a little bit about, about how this book is also a way of writing your way into literacy, into becoming a writer? You know, that that's definitely what it is. Um, this book is about education. It's about miseducation. It's about self-education, it's about street education, and it's about re-education. It's about the difference between school and education. I talk about my my different school experiences. You know, I was kicked out of every different school I went to when I was coming up, um, except for the school that I ended up graduating from, which was an alternative school. And Dr. Green, that's what I was talking about in terms of 
really letting young people know my story so that the young people who are struggling right now in school and all of these things understand that, you know, they're not alone. You know what I mean? Just, I was, you know, I was not on this path. You know what I mean? Um, and so that, that's, I think that's encouraging. Um, but I wanted to, uh, to, to kind of go back to this, this alternative school. I've been kicked out of a bunch of schools and I ended up in this alternative school, really weird school. And, um, you know, I was in a class and at this point, you know, I didn't do any, I wasn't writing. I wasn't reading. I wasn't really doing any schoolwork for a couple of years at that point. And, um, you know, I found myself in a class and I found myself in front of a blank sheet of paper being asked to write. And my first thought was, well, write about what? What do you want me to write about? Because my whole understanding of school was rote memorization and regurgitation. So you tell me to do something, I do it, and then I get a grade, and somehow we say that I'm learning. But, um, you know, the teacher said, well, write whatever you want to write. And, I, I, I mean, I thought she was playing a game. I, I didn't think she was serious about that. So, of course, the first thing I wrote, was F school, you know, <laughs> right. um, you know, and so she looked at that and she just said, well, keep going. And I really feel like from that moment, I haven't stopped. I kept going and I haven't stopped. I started to be interested in writing, telling my story. Um, I started to read. Um, you know, if you want to be a good writer, you got to be a good reader. I realized why reading was illegal for black people during slavery. My pop used to tell me that. My mom used to tell me that. My grandpa, you know, all, all the old people in my life would tell me, oh, back in the day, reading was illegal for young, you know. But I never really got it why it would be illegal until I started to really read. And I started to realize that we think in words and we sub-vocalize. And so if you limit someone's vocabulary and language, you're also limiting their thoughts their ideas, their potential. And so that became very powerful to me, and literacy and literature became connected to my own personal liberation. Um, and so, yeah, that's what the book is about as well, you know. It's about so many things, you know. There's yeah. so many different, and that's really why I chose the title Buck. Young Buck, Buck Wow, Buck Shots, Buck Town, Slave Buck, Black Buck, Make Buck, Buck Now, all of those different reasons, you know. Buck encompasses so many different ideas about what it's like, what it is, what it is, and who it is to be young black in America. An apt metaphor. Believe it or not, we are almost at a close. So as we come to a close, uh, um, I'd like you to, to answer. I'm going to kind of combine these questions. What message do you have for emerging writers, artists, hip-hop artists, our elders, and the community? And as um, we think about how we help to support black writers and black artists, do we still have a need for forums such as the National Black Writers Conference? So I just participated in the Juneteenth conference. Do we still need this in, in this society? And if so, why? Okay. Well, you know, my advice, my encouragement, you know, for the writers out there, for artists out there is, you know, to, to, to create your own lane, create your own path, you know, um, and to connect your work with the community, you know, and however, however, that's going to look different for everybody, but make sure that the work is connected, you know, um, and rooted, um, and so that it has impact in a real way in the community that you live in or are a part of, you know, I think that's important. Um, you know, I also think it's important to eliminate distractions, create positive energy, to not fear anything, and to attack all opportunities. I say that to young people all the time. And to transform observations into obligation. You know, um, I think those things are important. I also think that as far as, you know, the, these forums and these platforms, they're absolutely essential. You know what I mean? Um, we, we need, you know, it's like asking if, you know, HBCUs are still relevant. Of course, you know what I mean? They're, they're so relevant, and that's why I teach at Morgan State University. Um, they're, they're so important, you know, to, to our survival and to our, our progress. And historically, but also, uh, you know, speaking about our future, our collective future. So, um, and it's how we support each other. I mean, we all know, we all just saw the New York Times came out with that bogus list. Um, so we got to support each other. We got to support our own books. We got to support each other's endeavors um, and, and, you know, really not depend on outside forces to, um, to celebrate us. You have to celebrate ourselves. I love it. 
What's your next project, um, M. Professor Sante? Well, I want to let everybody know that we just came out with the Buck original book soundtrack. It's completely new and different. I mean, as far as I know, there's never been a soundtrack to a book where the music is, you know, composed of by, by the author. And so I created a soundtrack. It's 12 songs. It just came out. It's free. It's available online, mkasante.com, also at kwaliclub.com, because Talib Kwali, hip-hop artist, his company, Javoti Media, uh, actually presented the soundtrack. Um, so we've been performing the soundtrack. I'll be performing June, uh, I mean, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Brooklyn uh, with Talib Kwali at the Brooklyn Bowl and then at the uh, African Street Festival in Brooklyn. And so that's a big that's a big step for me because the soundtrack is very literary. If you listen to the soundtrack and read the book, you'll hear all the influence and references. And it's very, it's, it's a journey. It's a journey that actually parallels the book. And so it's, it's a real special, I put a lot of energy into it. Um, and it is uh, dedicated to my son, wonderful legacy Asante, who actually passed away during the recording of the soundtrack. And so it's very deep. It has a lot of spirituality and, and message and power and substance in it. Um, and so that's out, and that's new. Um, and then the other thing that I'm doing, I'm working on a new memoir called Go. Um, I'm working on the Buck movie. We have a Sundance Fellowship to, to turn Buck into a movie, so I'm working on that right now. Um, and, you know, I'm just uh, continuing to, to live and learn. We just came out with a video called Young Buck that we shot in the middle of the Baltimore rebellions or uprisings, and so people can watch that on YouTube. But, um, yeah, I'm just working. I'm just learning, growing. Uh, Exciting, exciting projects, and um, yeah. it's, it's very exciting. It's, it's really nice to see you and Talib collaborate. I know as soon as your book came out, he brought it for his son, <laughs> who's also a hip hop artist, as you as you may know. So I'm looking forward to yep. seeing you um, seeing you perform and getting that that CD. And I want to um, encourage our listening audience to go out and purchase Buck a memoir. To go to uh, web repeat your website again. My website is mkasante.com. Okay, mkasante.com. You can download the video. You can keep up with where you can see uh, MK Asante. And I, I thank you for um, having the courage to write such a riveting and memoir. This has been, but, yes. I was going to say thank you for doing what you do and being an ambassador for black art. We need you. We love you. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been Dr. Brenda Green. A host of Writers on Writing, I want to thank my engineer, Fritz Richardson, for always being supportive and being there. I invite you to visit our website at www.centerforblackliterature.org. Write us at writers at mec.cuny.edu and come back next week. Remember, the writer is always reading, the reader is always writing. Keep reading and writing. Empower yourselves as readers and writers. song was inspired by a poem written by Langston Hughes. I'm sure most of you have heard of Langston Hughes. And he wrote a poem about rivers.